Isn't God good? I don't know how you feel today, but this, your worship, your love, your hunger for God has been a gift to me and I believe to every mother and every person in this place. It's contagious when we come together. Hungry for God. Hungry for God to manifest his kingdom in us and through us. Amen. We're so happy to have Siggy with us and David and her sister and her sister's daughter. That's better than her niece. I, I, I wondered, we, my wife and I wondered how, we, we were first introduced to Siggy's ministry through, through friends, Jack and Lisa Legatella. Uh, Siggy used to come to uh, Lisa's church when she was in New York City for years. So I had, my wife uh, texted Lisa this morning and says, we're going to introduce Siggy. If you were here, how would you introduce her? Mother, missionary, evangelist, powerhouse. And wife. Thanks, son. Blame Lisa for that, David, not me. But that's how we met, Siggy and David. And uh, I remember the I have never been so challenged by a message on the book of the Song of Solomon as the first time I heard Siggy speak uh, here in the gallery in our cafe. And I have never heard her minister in a situation that was not both inspiring and challenging, uh, whether it be in our LifeNet Apostolic Network pastors gatherings or, or even here at Bethel. All I know is this. You're going to hear from a woman of God. Come on, Siggy. Thank you so much. It's such a great joy to be here. I'm just going to ask David to come and just tell you a little bit where we're going and what we're doing. And then I'm going to just start. It's just always a privilege to be here, to feel the presence of God and to see what God is doing in your church. It's a privilege to be here this month, uh, Missionaries Month. Uh, we've been missionaries uh, all of our lives since we've been married. In 1980, God spoke to us to go to South Africa, and uh, we felt really sent to go there. And we've been there ever since. We, start, we, we thought we'd stay six weeks, but we stayed 10 years. And then after that 10 years, we've been going back twice a year. So it's really been a fabric, you know, part of our life. Uh, we thank God for the work of the Spirit, the Holy Spirit there. The church is powerful. It's full of amazing things that are happening. And... Uh, we also spend time in Germany. Siggy ministers in German, uh, her native tongue. We'll be going to Germany in a few weeks and, uh, and also Australia. And we were last year in Mozambique. We're, wherever God sends us, we, we go. But South Africa has been really the country that really has changed our lives. And we thank God for that. And we thank God for the friends and the work of God in the hearts of many people there. Uh, as mentioned before, we have products there, uh, CDs and uh, uh, I won't take time to mention them, but there are some great messages that are new and fresh that you haven't heard Siggy minister on. Siggy's life story, her and Crystal grew up in East Berlin as young girls there under communism, uh, the Russian occupation. And uh, then also I would mention that Crystal has, she's written some song, uh, children's books that are there. And uh, I know a lot of women, uh, especially mothers, <laughs> like to have stuff for their children. So anyway, they're available, and thank you for, uh, we're just grateful to be here today. God bless you. Thank you. I'm going to minister out of the book of Esther, chapter 2. I'm not going to read the whole chapter, but I'm going to speak on the whole chapter, but I'm going to just ch jump from one to another. Yeah, I was just looking for it. Thank you. <laughs> Maybe you read along in case you don't understand my pronunciation. 
And these things, when the anger, when the anger of King Ashahiris had subsided, he remembered Vasta and what she had done and what her degree been against her. And the king attendants who served him said, let beautiful young virgin be sought for the king. And let the king appoint overseers in all the provinces of the kingdom that they might gather every beautiful young virgin in the citadel, Susha, in the harem into the custody of Haggai, the king's Enoch, so he is in charge of the women and let there be cosmetic given to them. And let the young lady who pleases the king be queen in place of Wastai. And this matter pleased the king, and he did accordingly. And there was in the citadel of Susa a Jew whose name was Mordecai, the son of Jai, the son of Shimea, the son of Kish, a Benjamite, who has taken, uh, been taken into exile from Jerusalem with the captivities who have been exiled with, with Yekonia, the king of Judah, whom Nebuchadnezzar, the king of Babylon, had exiled. He was bringing up Hadassah, that's Esther, his uncle's daughter, for she had no father, no mother. Now the young lady was beautiful in form and face, and when her father and her mother died, Mordecai took her in as his own daughter. Now I just want to jump to one more verse in verse 12. Now when the turn of each young lady came to go into the king after the end of her 12 months under the regulation for the women for the days of their beautification were completed is followed six months with oil if mirror and six months with spices for the cosmetic of the women. And the young lady would go into the king in the way anything that she desired was given her to take with her from the harem to the king's palace. And then I'm going to read to verse 15. Now when the turn of Esther, the daughter of Abihel, the uncle of Mordecai, who has taken her as his daughters came to go into the king, she did not request anything except what Haggai, the king's Enoch, was in, uh, in charge of the women, what he gave her. And Esther found favor in the eyes of all who saw her. Heavenly Father, I just thank you so much for the power of your spirit here today. I thank you, Lord, that you can take that old book of Esther and make it so alive and real for the church today. And I thank you, Lord, that you have keys to unlock mysteries for our own life and for our own generation and our own city and nation. And I pray that you bless America today. Lord, that you give a, a rise up the mothers to stand up in this day to even nurse the nation and to nurse the generation that this nation might come even in a new satisfaction. Lord, bless thy word, I pray in Jesus Christ's name. Amen. You know, the book of Esther is an amazing book. You never read anything about God, and there's never once mentioned anything about God. And yet, it's a key, not only for the church, but also for Israel. And you know, as I have been around the world, I'm preaching now about 50 years, and I have ministered in my maybe 80 to 90 countries. I have seen many times how God has raised up people in generations to make a difference in nation and to make a difference in cities in a tremendous way. And I believe as America is standing at the crossroad that God is going to bring forth a people who will understand what our destiny and purpose is. Now when you study the book of Esther, you realize that God awakened Esther and raised Esther up to save more Jews than I actually will save than the heir of Hitler. If God would not raise Esther up in that time on the Haman, from Ethiopia to India, 12 million Jews would have been wiped out at that time. And I think to myself how God takes people ordinary people and to the spirit of God he makes them extraordinary and you know as I look at the book of Esther you can see how God many times when one person lacks that God will use another person now 
As you study the first, first chapter, you realize that King Asahirius had a huge fast feast, a celebration for 180 days. And after the 180 days, he celebrated for seven days for every common man in his kingdom. And as he celebrated the seven days, he had one desire that he might show his queen. And he wanted to show the queen to the average man and to the princess because he was very proud of her. It says that she was very beautiful. Now I read some commentaries and it said that this was absolutely request no king should have had for a queen who walk, walks in, des in dignity and in respect. But you know, as I look at this, I realize something. It, that in that time, as the king called Wastai, he said, show me your beauty. And I believe in these days, as I look at this, and I was teaching on it, that the church today, we don't only show that we're saved, that we actually have to show our beauty because everything God's created, He does beautiful. And you know, many times beauty speaks, you cannot be beautiful because you have a certain face or you have a certain figure. Your beauty comes only as you understand that Jesus died, that we might have abundant life and that out of our life might come our rivers of living water. And I believe that the Vastai, Queen Vastai, did not understand how to show because to her it was a call of a foolish and a drunken king. And I believe in all our life there comes times where the Lord requests things of us where we have to show what he has done in us. And through us. And you know, sometimes there comes time in times in our life, doesn't matter if it's in a mission field or in your own home life, that the Lord requests from us to show what He has done in us and through us. My pastor said we're not just saved, but He saved us that we might get perfected, that we might understand our destiny and our calling. And I realized that whilst I thought it was a call of a foolish king. And I think many times in our life, there comes situation where many of us, even so we are saved for many years, cannot show our beauty. I remember when I went once in Captain Kuhlman's meeting, what she said. She said, I'm a substitute. Because somebody did not follow the call. Somebody did not understand. And I think today the church are going to call to a level we have never been called on. Because many times what happened is that our teaching creates a lifestyle without we are knowing what a life is. And you know, we are not there to protect the lifestyle. We are there to let that life of God flow through us to a, a river of living water. Now that I, you know what the Lord does. As he went throughout to look for virgins. Now, a virgin meets somebody who has not touched a man, who has not, and, and has not been experienced passion, has not experienced intimacy. And I know that many of us, we are innocent. Today the church has walked in innocence as we protect ourselves from evil. And as many times we don't understand the way of the Lord. But what the Lord is doing now, He's taking a church who has been innocent and he moves us into purity. Because the difference between innocent and purity is this. Innocence can be taken from you at any time. But purity can be never taken. Because purity has gone to the fire. Purity has gone to a process. Purity has gone. And it says what? Not the innocent shall see God. The pure in heart. And I know that these days we understand that the Lord is bringing forth the purity. And I look at Esther as we just coming from South Africa. 
God is moving in the church in South Africa in a phenomenal way. And you know, my, they don't even have to invite speakers because God is raising up amongst the people a revelation and a hunger and a dedication which puts the whole city on fire. Now, you see that that in what God is doing in this day, He's calling out Esther. He prepares to know that we are called for such a time as this into the kingdom. Because every one of us is born for destiny and is born for purpose. And I'm not, when I stand one day before the Lord, you have to ask yourself, do you realize that you can be safe for years and never fulfill your destiny and never fulfill your purpose in what God wants to do in your life? Now, ask the Men went out into the kingdom. And I believe this day, as God gives us grace to come into his kingdom, to come into his purpose, he is going doing, we, all of us are going to go to processes in our life. Because what he does, he is making me Christ-like. Now, as Esther comes, the key is this. How do I get a desire? To move into God's purpose. And many times I think of Adam and Eve. How Adam and Eve were in paradise. And I said, how in the world did Adam and Eve fall? In a completeness of the Lord. In Lord coming down. Imagine that Adam and Eve didn't know any desires. They had no craving. They had no longings. And yet, they fell. And they've been cast out of paradise. And I realize what the enemy has done. What did the serpent do? The serpent came into paradise. And what should she do? She awakened in Eve a desire. She said what? Look at the fruit. Look at how good the fruit it is. When you eat of the fruit, when you long for that fruit, you're going to be wise as God and you're going to have all the knowledge. And what happened? That desire and intensity became so strong that she actually that she disobeyed God and ate of the fruit in her life. And I know as you think and you think of Adam and Eve, how they had to create a desire at Cain and Abel to bring forth an offering, to yield their life unto him. And I thought to myself, when you look at Esther, a little Jewish girl who maybe had the dream of one Jewish husband, how would she have the power to lay down her dream? And to become a plan of a part of a plan and a part of a purpose. And I realize that as her uncle raised her, you know what her uncle means, Mordecai. The name Mordecai means the one who crushes the mirror. M-Y-R-R-H. Now, Mordecai, all these guys in exile, you look at Daniel, you look at Mordecai, you look at these men God has raised up in exile, in Nehemiah, they were prosperous. But how did Mordecai get a desire of it in Esther to fulfill a destiny and to fulfill a purpose? And I said, Lord, how do we change? I know that preaching cannot persuade you. You can have hundreds and hundreds of sermons and never change your point of view and never change your thinking. So how? In the middle of your life, how do we get to that place that we desire what God desires and we fulfill what God is fulfilling and we come to that place? And I realize, Mordecai, he was the first one coming out of captivity. Now what happens in captivity? In captivity you can be prosperous when you exile in a nation. But Mordecai know that the glory of God would never reveal itself in captivity. It was in Jerusalem. It was in a place of peace and a place of power. And out of that longing, 
He created something in Esther. Now Esther had no mom and pa. She had no mother. But Mordecai became even so he was a man, a mother, and a father. And you know what happened in his life? You have to realize what happened in all our life. You know what it says in Ezekiel chapter 16? It says your father was a Hittite and your mother was an Amorite. And thy navel was not yet cut. And I realize in all our life to fulfill our destiny, I have to go to that process for the word of God becomes a cutting instrument to cut the foreskin of my heart. Now, when the word of God comes, what happens when you birth a child? Now, I remember when my children was born. One of them was born and traveling, and, and, and I delivered her in a holiday inn. David delivered her between meetings. And I remember when I struggled and I labored in that holiday in room. And I realized what it meant to birth. And the lady who was with us, she said, you cannot cut the neighbor cord until it dies. And you see, as it dies, you cut the neighbor cord. Because if you cut the neighbor cord and it lives, you bleed to death. And the child will bleed to death. But when you cut the neighbor cord and it dies, you separate it. And today the church, many times we're still connected to Mother Earth. Our culture, the way we think, feeds us. And we are not allowed the word of God to come to cut away the thing to feed us. And now you know, if, if he does not cut it, you know what's happening. We have an American Jesus. We have a German Jesus. In other words, Jesus fits into our culture. We, we in Germany, Jesus allows the people to do different things and still be holy than what you do here. And here you do things in other countries you, you cannot do because it's not holy. I can, in some countries, I can preach like this. Not that I'm not preaching, can't preach, but the people could not accept me because that Jesus does not fit in her thinking, having pants on and preaching. So what happened? But how does the Lord come and call a nation out of a nation and the people out of the people? He has to do what? Cut away. And you know that cutting can only come as Esther. And when you look at Esther, how she comes in, and all of us, when the cutting comes, then the selection starts. And you know, hey, guys, a symbol of the Holy Spirit. And he takes Esther, and he brings her into a place where she gets in a place where he, because she finds favor, he gives her speedily things for purification. If I find favor in the Lord, it's not prosperity only. It's correction. It's discipline. It's comfort. Then I find favor with the Lord because it's not a lifestyle I will. It's a life I want to please the Lord. And for me to have favor, what do I need? Comfort, exhortation, edification. When I have the comfort, exhortation, and edification, he can cut. He can deal in my life. And you see, he would have to, have to go to, to come into the king. I'm just going to make it tight here. Six months of mirror and six months of sweet spices. Preparation to come before the king. Now, mirror speaks of suffering. Suffering, it's a big part of the church. We don't like suffering. But suffering, it's a part of enduring. Suffering, it's a part. When the fresh, we preach for fresh oil and for fresh wine. It only comes when the squeeze comes. When the squeeze of the oil and the squeeze of the wine. It's a suffering. You can never change. The wine and grapes are not the same. Oil and olives are not the same. They're coming out of the same substance, but they have to suffer. 
The olive has to suffer. The wine has to suffer so that the vine can come to mature and to become. And you see so many of us. The suffering is a part we don't like. For we, well, how do I suffer? It's not the intensity. It's the endurance. As I yield my life to the Lord, life is the endurance. As I can let the patience and the endurance come out of my life. In all of us. I realize when I go, even go in South Africa, how do you preach to people who've been in hostage situation? Many women are raped. I mean, just the other day as we were in the city, the people came and they wanted to have grants for the university. And the, the, the government didn't give it to them. And there were blocks around the, 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 the magistrate or the office building. And they didn't give them any accommodation for the night. And they're all sleeping on the night. And people got raped and robbed. And the church opened. And the church took in these suffering people. And the church is pulsating because they are ready to endure for the purpose and for the destiny of our life. And America is coming to a new place. For we can no longer just be security oriented. For we have to yield our life as living sacrifice. That out of the squeeze will come an aroma. And out of our life will come a fragrance. Not a stink, a fragrance. And then, six months of spices. Now, six months of spices means that you have an attitude of gratitude. Me too. You know, some of us, we don't have an attitude of gratitude. We have to pray to be thankful. Now, an attitude of gratitude has nothing today that I pray to be thankful. An attitude of gratitude is when you go on to the process and I yield my life as a living sacrifice unto the Lord and He can use it. And as she comes to it, that is when Esther enters the anointing, that oil. And today the anointing has to come in our life. Because I don't need only the anointing to preach. I need the anointing in my life as the Holy Ghost comes and he breaks the yoke and brings me what? You see, many of us, we have the right motor, but we don't have the right oil. Now, if you have a motor without the oil, you don't go anywhere. And you see, some of us, we have all the right function, but we don't have the oil. Because the oil can only come as I yield my life unto him. And when the Holy Spirit comes and he oils my life out of that life, it's not what you do, but how you flow to it. Now, what does he say here? He has thousands of women. And he, king, is going to pick one. Now, imagine if you've been poor. And you never had any ability to buy perfume or have any ability to go to any boutique to buy the greatest dresses and shoes you want. Now imagine thousand women trying to dress up to please one king. I believe many of them absolutely wore themselves out trying to dress. Only problem is this. None of them know the king. None of them knew what really the king liked. They only seen the king. They knew that they're going to enter the inner court. They knew that they would be intimate. It's with that many of us. We're trying to please Jesus. Don't really know what he likes. And what happens is we don't know what he likes. Then you get in manage, sin management. For we make ourselves certain lifestyles and restrictions. For we think we're holy or unholy. And we have an imagination which we think God likes. Now Esther did that. But why did she find favor? Because she realized there was only one who knew the king. That was Haggai. Everybody else didn't know the king. But Haggai, who was the inner chamberlain and the Enoch, who would prepare the vermin for the intimacy so that he could elect the queen. Now what did she do? She only took what Haggai gave her to wear. 
because it was not interesting that she pleased herself. She was there to please the king. And when you look at it, many of us, we don't know how to please the king. Only when I never know Jesus, I have not walked with him in my flesh. I only know how to please him when the Holy Spirit comes into my life. And he teaches me what pleases the king. Not what pleases religion. Not what pleases man. What pleases the king. And what happened? She found favor. Now, when you look at the book of Esther, that's not the end. That's the beginning. Because here's Mordecai. Knowing what's going on. And he comes to Esther and he realized that Haman has risen. And believe me, today in the world, there is rising a Haman to destroy the church. Haman has risen. You know who Haman was? Haman was an Amalek. God hated the Amaleks. They supposed to kill the Amalek. Saul failed many times because he did not conquer the Amaleks. David. Conquered the Amaleks. And Agak was one of the Amaleks. He had a hate for the Jews from the time it was in there from generation to generation. Like many hate the Jews and how it rises up even this day. And you know, as Esther, I realized as I read this, I said, how in the world did one woman have the power to rise up against a man who was out to destroy the whole nation, Israel. And I realized something, Esther. Remember, let me tell you just something. She was not called to the king for three months. And one day as Mordecai come and he says to her, as she was worried because she could not enter into the throne room. And he said, who knows you might come for such a time as this into the kingdom. Who knows? Who, who knows why you're born in this generation and not a generation to come? Who knows why you live right now here in Rochester and you don't live in some other country? Who knows? And you know, as she realizes, it, she cannot enter the throne room. And she knows that she, she was not called to the king for three months. Now, if she would have been manipulated woman, what would she have done? She would have used the bedroom to reveal the secret. What would she have done? She would have used perfume, given it to a concubine, and said, here, let the king, let the king have it. Maybe he will remind himself of me, and maybe in an hour of passion, I can tell him I'm a Jew, and that he has to help us. Now, what she do, you know, I read the story in the book of Josephus, one of the Jewish historians. And he said, as Esther fasted for three days and three nights, Remember, Esther did not know she'd never been into the throne room. She only knew the king as a husband. Now, as he was a husband, he took off his crown and he took off his robes and he was an uh, intimate and vulnerable. But she didn't know him as a king. She knew him as a husband. And you know what Josephus writes in this book? When you entered the throne room and you were not invited, Beside the throne room was about six guys standing with sharp swords. And if you entered the throne room and you were not invited, they would come if the scepter of life was not over you. They would come and they would kill you. And you know, as Esther says, if I perish, I perish. She says, Josephus writes, as she fasted, this time she did not prepare herself with spices, not with perfume and sensuality. This time she fasted three days, no water, no food. And you ever been on an Esther fast? You realize that your craving for water is much huger than for food. That you can only live a certain time without water. Even you can go on a hunger strikes for days. And as it says, Josephus says, 
as Esther came in, she was so overwhelmed because she never realized what the king was like. She only knew him as her husband. And as he stayed, sat there in the throne in his full glory and in his full power. You know what they said? He said that she fainted and that she was weak and that her weakness moved his heart. That she said, unto the half of my kingdom thou shalt have. And I thought to myself what the Lord said. He perfects his strength in what? In my weakness doesn't mean sin. In my vulnerability. In my helplessness. When I come to a place where I no longer fight or yield. You can never ever, me either, become spiritual striving. Never. You can become spiritual striving. Doesn't matter what you do. You can only become spiritual when I yield. When I yield to his purpose. Yield to his hand. Yield. And you know how many of us have the greatest struggle? Yielding. We can fight. But not yield. And you know Esther. She, she says, uh, I said Lord how did she get such wisdom? The Lord said what? To feel the Lord is the beginning of wisdom. Now, you know, he has an amazing blessing over the Danites, I think it was. You know, see, you know what he says about the Danites? That the Danites is like a snake in the ground. It bites what? The rider in the heel. Now, what did the Lord speak here about? He speaks about when you come to a place. Of weakness, of yielding, you become low. And you see what happened? He said, Imagine that. He said, A half of my kingdom you shall have. Now imagine us charismatics. Half a power, half a money, half a gold, half a riches. She. And she says, No, no, I don't want to tell you my request. I want to invite Haman for dinner. I have a banquet for Haman and you. And I, when you come in that banquet, I'm going to ask Haman of what happens. Pride goes before the fall. And what did Esther do? Because she went low. She went low to the ground like a serpent. She was so low to the ground, what did she do? She bit the rider in the heel. She fed him and proud, pride. And when he come, he comes home to his wife and he says, guess what? I'm such an important man. I'm going to kill Mordecai. I'm ready to wipe them out. I have erected the gallow. I'm going to hang them. And he's so proud that he gets so blind. And he doesn't know that that gallow would be for him. And you see, for the church today, some of us, we don't know how to be coming to the ground. We always have to be proud of something. But what did the Lord do? Today, as we're coming against big, powerful system, I say, God, how are we going to come against it? I mean, I remember when I used to smuggle Bibles and we came against the Soviet system. Just the other day, the parade, parade in Moscow was just like that. The parade. And I said, Lord, where's the church going to be? How are we going to compete against this government, against this carnality, against this power? And I realized the church is a woman. The church has to please the king. The church has to know how to come into the throne room and let the life of God in the most un -circum un unfavorable circumstances breathe life into us. And I know that many of Americans are going to confront big issues in these days. For some of our belief systems we have built are going to be broken. Some of these things we have believed 
they will not work because our belief system is not enough. Belief system doesn't mean faith. Faith. Faith is not an it. Faith is a trust. Not in it. Trust in him in the greatest trials of our life. And I know this day the Church of America is to rise up. To become a people who will no longer manipulate. I believe that God is going to take every one of us. And he's leading us out of innocence. Into purity. Because he's going to strip us of belief system we have established in our heads and in our lives. We have worked. And we had a certain society which we have built around it. But when the society is breaking down, I, I ask my mother many times, what did the church do? Do you know what happened? They, I read, I'm reading right now a huge book on the refuseniks in, in Russia. They say, as the Tsar was falling, and I, these things are happening, you know what the church did? They had a big argument what to do with the leftover wine and leftover bread. And they had big fights about things in a time as the Bolsheviks were running to Russia, closing the churches and synagogues as the church struggled to things which we think is important. And I know in these days in my heart as I travel the nation, there's never been a time like this for the church. There's never has been a time in this moment for God is going to make history to men and women who will not preserve their lives but lose their lives. Who will not watch their lifestyle but give their life. Totally. And you know, I Realize as Esther, what she do? She did three things. She gave weapon in the hand to conquer victory. Hundreds of people converted to Judaism, you read it. And she has a feast, Purim, which she still celebrate every Jewish person who believes, celebrates, for they declare Haman has been defeated to two. Mordecai, the one who crushes the mirror and the one who became a mother and a father to breathe life into a woman, not to fulfill her own dream, but to yield her life for the purpose and for the destiny. And I just want you to look, I don't even know, I think I have to close, but I just want you to look in your heart just for a moment. And be honest, how many things are shifting in our lives? How many things are breaking? You know, out of the breaking, breaking is powerful. Out of the breaking comes the aroma. Out of the breaking comes the fragrance. When that alabaster box is broken, when my life is broken, that doesn't mean emotional pain. It means yieldedness of will and yieldedness of life. And I know America's church has gone to great shifting into great ideas. But God is calling a people out of the people and a nation out of the nation to fulfill his destiny and purpose so that this nation, America, United States of America, how do you think we got freedom and liberty? I used to, Crystal and I, when I said, that's high. All I wanted to be American. I didn't know anything about constitution. I didn't know about your food. We couldn't even speak your language. But since I'm this high, I wanted to be American. I wanted to be in this nation. I love this nation because to us, America was not lifestyle. America was freedom. We climb up the attics to listen to the voice of America. We would touch the American soldiers' hands. 
when we went to the West. And in war, in war, and in the end of war, America have placed love in our life. Christopher and mine and many other can tell you of men who have crowded and pulled a slave labor camp in the snow to kiss the American flag, not to come to have a better life. Because America, to us oppressed ones, was freedom. Freedom to worship and freedom to become and freedom to give and freedom to live. And if the church loses her freedom to surrender and to pour out their lives, the nation will lose it. And today, after many of us, we protect our lifestyle so much that we're scared to lose. And only as we lose can we gain. Lose your life and you shall gain it. And you know, God has much more than I can ever work for, pray for, desire. All he needs in my life is to yield my life as a living sacrifice. And I believe this day God needs Mordecai and Esther because Haman is rising. Haman will come against the truth and the light to bring darkness, not only in countries, but in hearts and in minds and in life. But you know what the Lord said? Greater is he who is in me than he who is in the world. Would you bow your head? <laughs> Heavenly Father, I just thank you for this wonderful church, for the pastors, for the ministries, for the vision you have given within the heart of these men and women for Bethel. Lord, what a name. Lord, Bethel is not a place of convenience. Bethel is always a place of obedience. And Lord, many times you have brought your light and your revelation in this church to men and women who have built altars of obediences and not altars of conveniences. And Lord, as you going to bless Bethel, Lord, as you have done things and you have shaken and you have blown your wind and you have separated chaff from wheat and light from darkness, Lord, you have a purpose for this ministry and for this nation and to this girl and to this church, Lord, you not only reach America because you reach the nations. And I pray, oh Lord, that this mission that it will not be just something we we'll do, but it will be a power and a burning desire, Lord, within us. Because as we give to the missions of this world, where you can truly bring forth your fire and your revelation, we can touch nations and cities and generations. Lord, how the world needs you. How the cities need you. How lives need you. And I just pray this morning that you will raise up Esther's. Lord, men and women who will not walk in innocence but in purity, who will walk to the process of fire, Lord, and yield to that fire because, Lord, many times we have to yield as you talk to the church of Ephesus and you said, come on back. Come back to your first love. And the only way I can come back again and again to my first love is to yield to your purpose and yield to your destiny. Bless every mother today. Bless every father. Lord, many fathers have to be mothers, and many mothers have to also be fathers. And I pray the day, O Lord, that you will give us the courage to go low. Because only as we go low, O Lord, can you feed the pride of those who go into destruction. I pray for America. How I love this nation. Lord, you have much hope for this nation. And I pray, O oh Lord, that you give us the ability to choose rightly, that our desires will not be formed to the illumination of the one who fights you. 
Lord, that help us that our desires are curbed and that you can give us new desires and new longings in our heart which does not come to our fleshly stimulation to the love of the world and the love of our life. But Lord, the only way I knew how to change my desires to love you with all my heart, with all my mind, and with all my life and my neighbor as myself. So, Lord, this day I pray, take your nail scarred finger, put it in the keyhole of our souls, and unlock us for destiny and purpose so that we won't stand one day before you and say we have lived, but we have not lived for you. Lord, we have had you in our life, but we did not go into your life. Bless this church, I pray, in Jesus Christ's name.